Hi guys, and welcome to another lecture from Dr. Bayliss on Introduction to Human Physiology. Today we'll be an in introduction to the nervous system and looking at some general physiology for this lecture today. Um, next lecture we will get a little bit more deeper on the actual physiology of action potentials and neurotransmitters within the nervous system. But today will just be kind of an overview physiology on there. So hopefully you went ahead and have your um, notes up that I posted to go along with this lecture. So let's dive into it. So introduction to the nervous system. It's chapter 12 within your textbook as we go through here. So when we look at the nervous system itself, right, the nervous system we're going to kind of divide in this hierarchy. So the overall nervous system, right, if we look at it from body worlds, um, this is actually a nervous system from a human, right, taking its brain, its spinal cord, and nerves out there within the system. Um, as we stated, it goes hand in hand with the endocrine unit we just learned about in controlling the body and telling it what to do and overseeing it, right, overseeing those homeostatic mechanisms. Remember, within feedback systems, the receptors and control centers were all part of the nervous system, right? Those effectors, as we saw from the last lecture, um, are predominantly of the endocrine system within there. So <clears throat> as we move forward, the nervous system we're going to break down into two parts. A lot of this is anatomy at the beginning, right, um, with some physiology thrown in there. So the central nervous system also known as your CNS, is your brain and spinal cord. So it's well protected within your body. Um, both of those are encased within bone, right? Your skull, your cranium is encasing your brain, protecting it. Your vertebra are encasing your spinal cord, protecting it. So um, structures you cannot live without. Right? You can damage them, but it will have um, far-reaching effects of your overall life within there. Other part, right, so if we look at it, here's a cadaver specimen from a human. Other part is your peripheral nervous system. So that is known as your PNS, and that's all your cranial and spinal nerves. So if you kind of look at this picture up there, all those green things going out into the body. So any part of the nervous system that's not the brain and spinal cord belongs to the peripheral nervous system. So all those receptors we talked about within um, a feedback system are going to be part of the peripheral nervous system. From there, when we look at the nervous system, the physiology behind it is um, it's all about creating signals. In this case, there are electrical chemical signals as opposed to um, chemical signals of the endocrine system, right? That was a hormone and it got dumped into your um, typically your bloodstream and just got disseminated throughout your whole body. When we look at the nervous system, <clears throat> it's going to create electrical signals that are going to follow along the course of nerves to specific parts of the body within there. Because of that, um, they are unidirectional. So these signals only go in one way. So think of them like kind of one-way streets. So first one we're going to look at within here is your sensory division, also known as afferent. And that's going to be signals, that electrical signals, going from your peripheral nervous system to your central nervous system. So going from your body to your brain is another way I like to put that. Um, one way of remembering that is this A, right, in afferent, is arriving at the brain, right? Every, your brain's your master computer, so everything's about the brain. So if it's arriving at it, we say it's sensory. It's coming from your body, right? And eventually ending up in here. Whereas the opposite of that, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, we'll continue on with the sensory. We have two different parts to that, a somatic sensory and a visceral sensory. So. Um, somatic means body, 
So this is the sensations you feel from your body. So you can think of things that you feel on your skin. So temperature, sensation um, would be somatic sensory. Um, pain within there would be somatic sensory. Um, light touch, tickle, itch, all those would be somatic sensory. Um, our special senses would be somatic sensory, things like taste, hearing, um, vision are all somatic sensory. So they're coming from our body, right, and going to our brain. The other are visceral sensory. Visceral means organs. So these are, right, um, things coming from those receptors from our organs in our body, right? Maybe it's our stomach, right? Telling our brain it's empty and it wants food, right? Or, right, telling us that we have pain, right? We have pain receptors inside of our visceral, right? So that we know that we have problems going on within there. So visceral sensory is information about your organs. And somatic sensory is information from your body, right? Both of the, all this information is going to end up in your brain. So it's going body to brain. And it's basically those receptors of that homeostatic mechanism, giving that input to your brain, letting it know how it's doing, what it's about, right? What it's feeling. Typically, somatic sensory is what we call conscious and visceral is typically what we call unconscious. Not always, right? But sometimes um, it is within there. The other side of this, right, was motor division. And motor is just the opposite. That's your central nervous system telling your body to do something. All right? So that would be that, right, communication and that feedback system from your control center to an effector like your muscle, right? We're cold, and so your brain telling your muscles to shiver, to move. So that's going brain to body. Or another way you can look at it, right? It's known as efferent, so it's E for exiting the brain to go and tell the body to do something. Within there, we have two basic divisions. One is your conscious division, and one is your unconscious division. Your conscious division is your somatic motor. So that's going out to skeletal muscles within your body, telling them to do some sort of task, right? Get up right now because you've been sitting in the chair too long listening to my lectures, right? And you want to get up and go to the kitchen and get something to drink. That would be all somatic motor, your brain telling your body how to do that and what to do. Whereas the opposite of that is the autonomic nervous system or ANS. Of that we alluded to it a little bit in the last lecture on the endocrine system, right, is there are two parts to that autonomic nervous system and that's the sympathetic portion and the parasympathetic. They are antagonists of each other. Sympathetic nervous system is known as your fight or flight. And your parasympathetic is known as your rest and digest. Right? So typically you can think of, right, your body should be more in the parasympathetic state most of the time as opposed to the sympathetic. The problem is we get so stressed out in our world nowadays, right, is we live too much in the sympathetic nervous system and it starts to break down our body. Right? It's kind of like running your car at 100 miles an hour Right? If I do that all the time, it's going to wear out a lot faster than if I right, cruise the speed limit and go 65. So now we're going to dive into the tissues. Remember, tissues are made up of um, cells that have a similar physiology within there. So the nervous tissue, there's two major camps of cells that make up nervous tissue. And that's neurons, right? And their job is to actually create those electrical signals and send them throughout the body to go, right? So not only to create that electricity, but then to have a conduit to make it 
go to some other place within their body. And then neuroglia cells, which is a group of cells that we will look at, six different cells within there, that help protect and maintain those neurons so that the neurons can do their job, right? Um, so they keep, as I like to put it, they keep the neurons healthy and happy. And we have far more neuroglia cells than we do neurons within our body. So we're going to look at those. We're going to look at the neuroglia first, those helper cells. So the first one is an astrocyte. So astrocytes kind of <clears throat> do a few different jobs. Number one job is maintain this blood-brain barrier. So you can see this astrocyte here. It gets its name because it's got a nucleus and a round part of the cell that looks like most cells, but then it's got all these right extensions that come off of it, kind of looking like little arms, like tentacles, and they wrap themselves around other cells within there. So this yellow one is a neuron, so it's wrapping itself around a neuron. These purple are blood vessels, it's wrapping itself around a blood vessel. So you can see by doing this, it's help holding things in place but it also creates this blood-brain barrier. So as it wraps around the blood vessels, these capillaries, is it creates another layer around it. So it's harder for things to get out of the blood and into your um, central nervous system because this wraps around it. So it's another control mechanism. Um, they're really good at um, keeping viruses and bacteria from getting into your brain, right? Um, not, right? Very common for us to get the common flu, right? Every winter as we're coming into the winter season, but not very common. And typically most of us will go an entire lifetime without getting a viral infection within our um, central nervous system. So that would be things like meningitis or encephalitis. Um, so most people don't ever contract that. So one of the reasons why is not because those viruses don't get into our body. They do. It's just they can't get through this barrier to get into our central nervous system. So that's the blood-brain barrier. One of the downsides is it's harder if we want to get drugs into the brain to influence the brain is we have to somehow trick the system so we can get bypass it. Right. As I stated, they kind of hold things together. So by reaching out and grabbing a hold of all these different things, they're holding it together. All right. <clears throat> Once again, regulating nutritional and waste, right? Getting in and out. And they help repair. So there is some repair that does happen within the nervous system or the central nervous system within your brain and spinal cord. It does repair a little bit. Right? The problem is if we damage it on any significant level, it's hard to recover from that. Next neuroglia is what we call an oligodendrocyte. Right? A big word it is phonetically sounded. So an oligodendrocyte, once again, kind of looks like that astrocyte in that it's right, got a cell with these funky looking little projections that come off of it. And once again, those projections wrap around other structures. With oligodendrocytes, what they do right, is they add structural support since they're holding things together. All right? And the other big thing that they do is they create this thing called a myelin sheet. So a myelin sheet, here we can see this bluish cell membrane that's wrapped itself around that neuron. Right? This is the axon and the neuron, and myelin sheets wrap around it and act like insulation. So you can kind of think of, right, since this is the cell membrane, it's made out of fat, so this is wrapping fat around this axon. It insulates it, right? Fat is a good insulator within there. You know, think of it like the coating, right, on your electric cord, maybe to your laptop right now, right? It's got that plastic coating around it. That's kind of like myelin is to an axon. It's protecting that inner wire because this <clears throat> beige structure right here is where the actual electrical impulse is going to propagate. 
third neuroglia cell is a microglia. All right, and a microglia's job is basically kind of on the immune side. So it's going to help remove waste that builds up any pathogens that do get into the central nervous system, right, that do get past that blood-brain barrier from your astrocytes. It helps fight those off and get rid of those. Right, so kind of a two-fold job to those microglia. They're helping right, immune system-wise and getting rid of pathogens, right, things that shouldn't be in there, viruses, bacteria, that type of stuff, and kind of cleaning up all the waste in there, cellular debris, other waste material within there. So keeping it so we don't um, have a lot of right, trash buildup. That wouldn't be good within your central nervous system. And the fourth one within your central nervous system is epidymal cells. And epidymal cells are these funky looking guys, right? They are um, columnar looking type cells and they form a barrier within here. So kind of look like um, epithelial tissue. They have, right, um, cilia on their border and their job, oops, I'm sorry, their job is to create this stuff called cerebral spinal fluid. So their job is to create it, so they make that fluid, and then they help with the cilia beat back and forth and move it along, right? So it circulates within the brain and spinal cord. And cerebral spinal fluid, <clears throat> we'll look at a little bit later, um, has a couple of um, jobs, physiology in there. One is to um, bring nutrients to the brain, right? So there's a high amount of sugar and things like that within that fluid. So the brain cells can have their metabolism. It also acts as a cushion. So it surrounds the brain and spinal cord. So there's fluid barrier around it, another layer of protection. So those first four cells were found in the central nervous system. These last two neuroglia cells we're going to look at are found in the peripheral nervous system. So the first one is a satellite cell. And a satellite cell is kind of like a catch-all cell in the uh, peripheral nervous system. So it helps with exchanging nutrients and waste within there, helps hold things together. Um, so it does a little bit of everything. The last neuroglia cell, right, the second one within the peripheral nervous system is this thing called a Schwann cell. And a Schwann cell, once again, creates myelin sheets. So here we can see, right, it created this layers wrapping of fat around the axon, just like the oligodendrocyte did. So Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes right, are, have the same similar function within there. They both create myelin sheets, um, but they do it in two different places. Schwann cells do it in your peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes do it in your um, central nervous system. The other thing that these cells do that oligodendrocytes do not do, um, and that is doing a really good job at regeneration. So the reason being is um, they do it a little bit differently. Each one of these is the actual cell. So the cell comes up, as we can see here. So it comes up to that axon and starts wrapping itself around it. And as it wraps itself around it, right, it creates this myelin sheet but it pushes all the contents of the cell to the outward right, layer of it. Kind of think of as you start to roll up your toothpaste tube. That's kind of what's happening here. So this myelin is protecting the axon, um, but because all the cell contents are right there next to the axon, whereas that set up for the oligodendrocyte, the cell body was way away from it, and it sent out a, like a tentacle that wrapped around it. Um, because it's right there next to it, it's able to aid in regeneration and allow 
um, nerves in your peripheral nervous system to actually grow back together. So that's a reason why, right, you could accidentally chop off your finger and the doctors could sew that back on, right, and we can expect those nerves to grow back together, right? We put the two ends of the nerve next to each other and sew them back together and because of these cells within the peripheral nervous system, it's going to actually allow them to grow back together. It's a slow process and takes months, sometimes even years for that to happen, but it can happen. Whereas if that happened in your spinal cord, right, these cells aren't in your spinal cord, it's illegal dendrocytes, um, we don't get that type of regeneration and that, right, severing of that nerve would be a permanent thing. Right, so those are your neuroglia, your six neuroglia cells. Once again, to recap them, four of them are in your central nervous system, so your brain and spinal cord, and those four are your astrocytes, your oligodendrocytes, your microglia, and your epidymal cells. The last two neuroglia cells are in your peripheral nervous system, and those are your satellite cells and your Schwann cells. Now we're going to move into the other major type of cell within your nervous tissue, and that's the neuron. Remember, we said the neuron's job was to create these chemical signals, right? And these chemical signals that it creates are called potentials. So there's two different types. There's graded potentials and action potentials that we'll look at within there. Right. And when we look at the neuron, it's got some unique properties to it. That's why nervous tissue is its own type of tissue. And one of those unique properties is it's electrically excitable. Right? It shares the same property with muscle cell, right? but connective tissue and epithelial tissue do not have this property. So that means we, <clears throat> in the case of a neuron, is it typically right, is creating its own electricity, its own potential, and it's that excitability, but I can also override it, right? I can stimulate a nerve, and it will respond to that electrical impulse that I put into it. And kind of some anatomy of it. When we look at it, it typically is that funky-looking shape like this, where once again we have a round part that kind of looks like a normal cell with a nucleus in it, but then it's got all these funky looking, once again, projections coming off of it. So the soma, right, is the round part that looks like a normal cell. Remember, soma means body, so that's the part that looks like the body of a normal cell. Within there, right, it's got a nucleus, like all your other cells just about within your body. These things called nissel bodies, which help in regeneration that we'll look at later on in this unit. And then it's got all these extensions coming off of it. And there's basically two groups of extensions. There's one that's called an axon and one that's called a dendrite. And remember we went back to, right, we said the nervous system was all like one-way streets. We had the um, sensory part of the nervous system in which these neurons took information from your body to your brain, and then we had a motor part in which it took this information, these signals from your brain to your body. So that's what these potentials we're talking about. So if the information is going from the outside towards the soma, then if it's traveling along extensions, it's going this way, right? So we're going left to right, is that would be a dendrite. And on dendrites and soma, we find these things called graded potentials that we'll look at more than our next lecture. Right? Whereas the axon is this other part, it's typically longer, not always, um, within there. And that's going to carry that electrical signal away from the soma. So once again, it's starting, right? It started over here, went down a dendrite went through the soma, and now it's leaving the soma to go down to the other end, down here. And this will communicate typically with another neuron. It could uh, communicate with a muscle cell down here. So that information is only going in this direction. It can't go back the other way. 
So that's that one-way street that we were talking about within there. Um, and these dendrites or these axons can be super long, right? Neurons um, are very small cells. We can't see them without a microscope, but um, they can be very small from end to end. So if we look at it from the end of the dendrites to the end of the axon, we could be looking at microns, right, which are thousands, right, of a um, millimeter within there. So a micron is really, really small. Or it could be from this end to this end, could be three or four feet, right, believe it or not, right? This part of the neuron could be in your low back, in your lumbar region, and the end of the axon could be down into your big toe. All right, so crazy to think of it that way. So they can be extremely long, um, up three, four feet long within there. But just because they're long <clears throat> still doesn't mean that we can see them. We still can't see them without a microscope. Kind of think of, right, a spider web is the analogy I always like to make, right? It's real easy to not see a spider web, right? Or especially only a few strands of a spider web because it's extremely thin, right? Um, but if they're super long, they span, right, feet within there. So same kind of thing within a neuron. Um, some other areas that we need to understand, we need to understand this anatomy first before we can go into the physiology, is this area where the axon attaches to the soma. So where it gets bigger right here, that's called the axon hillock. Hillock means little hill, or it's also known as the trigger zone. Um, I refer to it a lot as the trigger zone just because it makes more sense with um, the physiology behind it. But that's the attachment of the axon to the soma. And then at the other end of the axon, we have things called synaptic terminals or synaptic bulbs. And the very ends <clears throat> uh, um, fan out and get right into this. You can see into all these littler projections at the end of each one of these little projections is a bulb-like little end to it within there. So if we go back, I'm going to kind of go back to that original picture where it's bigger. right? So if we look at it once again, Right, the structure of a neuron, the middle round part that looks like a normal cell is the soma. The um, extensions coming off of it, if information is going towards the cell body, then these are dendrites. If information is going away from the cell body, so here we can see the arrows going from left to right, this is an axon. At the end, right, we have synaptic terminals where it starts to branch off. At the very end of each one of those terminals is what's called a synaptic bulb that kind of bulges out there. So that's that overall anatomy, right? And once again, where this axon attaches to the soma is the axon hillock or trigger zone. Okay, so as we go through here. Right? So those are the different types of cells within nervous tissue. And <clears throat> now we're going to kind of, from here on out, just talk about neurons, because they're the ones that are creating the signals in this communication. So um, we already went over the physiology, right, the jobs of each one of those six neuroglia cells. So now when we look at neurons, we're going to classify them two different ways. One is structural. So structural classifications is how it looks, right? A single-story house looks very different than a two-story house, which looks very different than right a high-rise building. So they look different structurally. So our three types of structural classifications are multipolar, bipolar, and pseudo-unipolar within there. Um, what we mean by there, the polar is talking about these extensions coming off of it. So multi means it's obviously got more than two. So three or more little extensions coming off the soma, then we say it's multipolar. Um, multipolar is the most common, MC stands for most common. It's the most common type of neuron within your body um, and found within the um, central nervous system.
right? So most of the neurons in your brain and spinal cord are the multipolar type. Then the next one, bipolar. So bipolar, bi means two, so it's got two extensions. So if we look at the cell body, right, there's only two extensions coming off of it, right? I know at the end they branch out, right? So at the very ends, we'd see a lot more, right? extensions out there, but if we just counting how many come off the cell body, off the soma, there are two. All right, bipolar neurons are found in your special senses. So these are the neurons in your eyes in, um, that allow you to see, that are in your mouth, that allow you to taste, that are in your nose, that allow you to smell, that are in your ears, that allow you to hear. Okay, those are all bipolar neurons within there. It has nothing to do with someone having bipolar disorder. Okay, so if you have that right um, medical term that's called bipolar disorder, it doesn't mean that you have a problem with these neurons. It has nothing to do with it. Okay, just thought I'd throw that out there. The last one is pseudo unipolar. So pseudo means fake or false. So these look like um, only one thing's coming off of the neuron, um, but they pretty much act like a bipolar neuron within there. So pseudo unipolar, here once again we find this soma and we count how many things are coming off of it. There's only one little thing coming off of it, even though it's very short, nubby-like, and then it branches out to either side. So once again, looking at these arrows, that's direction of current. This side would be the dendrite, right, and this side would be the axon. Right, so these are all axons, right? On this side, on the left-hand side, are all dendrites. And this last type, these pseudo unipolar, this is most of the neurons found in your um, the sensory portion of your peripheral nervous system. Now we're going to look at functional classifications. So this is another way of classifying neurons, but this is based off of right their job of what they're doing within there. So we have <clears throat> sensory or afferent neurons. Remember we talked about that at the very first slide. We said afferent neurons go from body to your brain. And as I just stated on that last slide, the most common type are pseudo unipolar. So here we can see this blue one. Right, that's an afferent neuron. So out here, this is the peripheral nervous system. Here we're looking at the spinal cord. So now we're central nervous system. So it's going from body to central nervous system or eventually to the brain. So that's an afferent neuron. You can see once again, it's pseudo unipolar. So this portion would be the dendrite. This portion is the axon because the information is going this way. Next one is motor. So that would be this red one. So motor, most are multipolar within there. And information is going to go from body, I mean from brain to your body. So your spinal cord, right, your central nervous system to your peripheral nervous system. So information is going out that way. So all these little things are dendrites. This big long one is an axon, right? And once again, these could be super long, right? This could be a neuron that's controlling the muscles in your feet. And this part of it is in your lumbar spine. And this part is going to the muscles down in your feet. So this axon could be three feet long, right? Or it could be sensation from your big toe, right? So <clears throat> this end of the neurons in your lumbar spine, this end of the neurons in your big toe. So once again, they can be super long within there. Right, then we have these little green guys, interneurons. So interneurons are these communication between the two other systems. So where we're integrating, where we're taking that information from our body, right, and thinking about it, and right, we could act upon it. Think of that homeostasis. So that afferent, right, would be that receptor. Right? The interneurons are that control center. It's integrating. It's looking at that data and saying, do I want to do anything about it? Right? Do I want to? Right? I'm too cold, so I'm going to tell my muscles right, to start shivering within there. So that's interneurons. And once again, multipolar. 
Right? That's what makes up your brain are all these interneurons connecting the two systems, your sensory and motor. So hopefully that makes a little um, sense there. Um, if we look at, um, oh, we'll come back to that other part. So <clears throat> how do they actually communicate? Right? What's going on? Right? Are they sending notes to one another, right? Smoke signals, text, what is it? Right? It's this chemical electrical um, stuff that's going through your body right now, kind of the same way that electricity works, right? It works off of a battery, works off of chemical electricity within there. So if we look at um, current, right, a neuron, so here we have a neuron, and if we actually hooked up a voltmeter to it, which just tells us voltage, um, is there would actually be voltage within your nervous system. So there's electricity right now in your brain and in your nerves traveling around your body, but you don't feel electrocuted because it's on the level of millivolts. So that's a thousandth of a volt. So extremely, extremely small, right? When we look at the electricity in your house, that's 120 volts, all right? Here we're looking at, right, anywhere from a negative 70 to about a positive 30 millivolts. So that's why we don't feel electrocuted zipping around in there, but it is actual electricity. In order for there to have electricity is there has to be a charge difference, right? We have to have a positive and a negative. Just like on your batteries, right, there's a positive and a negative. Um, to your batteries that are like in your cell phone or in your flashlight and stuff. It's the same way here, right? And the opposites attract. Positives, positive ions are attracted to negative ions and vice versa. So I kind of gave a hint. That's how this system works is it uses ions to make these charges. But in order for that to exist, right, we need a membrane, this selectively permeable membrane that's keeping those two charges separated from each other because they this one wants to go to that one and that one wants to go to this one and they'd cancel each other out if they canceled each other out then if i'd look at my voltmeter it would read zero right if i just let them right go that way so when we look at this electrical current that they're generating as I alluded to on the previous slide, was we had graded potentials and action potentials. All right. Graded potentials are what happen along the dendrites. Action potentials are what happen along the axon. All right. So easy way to think of that is A and axon, A and action potential. Action potentials are um, able to travel long distances. Okay. So they can travel from you know, those are the ones that are able to travel those three, four feet within there without running out of steam. Um, the analogy I kind of <clears throat> make to action potentials when we talk about them, kind of think of them like dominoes, right? If I set up dominoes, I can have dominoes that are only a foot long, right? Or I could set up dominoes, if I was really good at it, that was, right, 100 yards long, right? And it takes just as much energy to make the one it's one foot long, right? All fall down as it did the one that was a hundred yards long. Whereas graded potentials, okay, travel short distances, right? Um, microns within there, so very very short distances. Um, think of those like waves; they act like waves. So they're able to change their amplitude, right? But it's going to decrease with the distance it has to travel. So if I create an electrical signal that's a graded potential, the farther it travels, the weaker it's going to get. Whereas that won't happen with action potentials. Right? So these charges, this electricity, happen because of plus and minus ions and those flow of ions, right? We said positives want to find negatives and negatives want to find positives, right? But what's keeping them separated is that cell membrane. So if I put channels in that cell membrane, right? Little openings, 
and allow only certain things to move through there, right? I can control that movement of pluses and minuses, which is what the nervous system does to create that electricity or that flow, right? Flow of um, electrons within electricity is known as current. Um, flow of, right, charges, those pluses and minuses within your nervous system, right, is that current within there. And so there are a few different types of these channels within the cell membrane of a neuron. And you need to understand these channels in order to understand the physiology. So the first one is a sodium potassium pump. So it's active transport. Remember all the way back to that first unit we looked at, active transport needs energy, right, and is going against the concentration gradient. So it's going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, and it requires ATP. So that's why we call it a pump, right? Most pumps you have to plug in, right? They require electricity to work. And then there are channels in the cell membrane that are kind of like open doors, right, or tunnels, and they just allow things to pass in and out, right? It doesn't matter what they are. So things are always flowing through leakage channels, trying to reach equilibrium. So kind of these first two oppose one another. Leakage channels are trying to create a level of equilibrium. Sodium potassium pumps are trying to keep it out of equilibrium. Um, when we look at leakage channels, um, the two ions, we haven't talked about it, that come into play are sodium and potassium, right? K is potassium, Na is sodium. They're both positive ions. They're cations within there. Um, you have a lot more um, potassium leakage channels than you do sodium, so it allows more movement of potassium than it does sodium. Then we have ligand-gated channels. So ligand-gated channels are going to be, right, they're gated channels, so they have a door on them that opens and closes in response to some sort of stimulus. All right, so the stimulus for a ligand-gated channel is going to be some chemical, right? So some sort of chemical, if it's the right chemical, right, it's going to fit into that lock and key, and it's going to open up the door within there. We have a fourth type of channel called a voltage-gated channel. So once again, it's a channel with a door on it. It's got a door that opens and closes. But this door, instead of responding to certain chemicals, responds to certain voltage. Right? So if, it's a, go, if it hits a negative 55 millivolts, you'll see that sodium doors swing open. Right? If the voltage in the neuron hits a plus 30 um, millivolts, then doors for um, potassium gated voltage gated channels open and allow potassium to move. So these are in response to different changes in voltage is what opens and closes those doors. And the last one is mechanically gated. So mechanically gated um, channels, once again, they're gated, so they're selective. The door only opens to a certain mechanical pressure. So when you hit a certain pressure or vibration, then that's what opens those doors. All right, so kind of looking at them, these um, sodium potassium pumps. So here, once again, we can see their active transport. They require energy, and they're going against the concentration gradient. Right, leakage channel, we said, are just like open doors. They allow things just to move um, by straight diffusion, so they're trying to eat, um, reach equilibrium. So leakage channels and sodium-potassium pumps um, oppose one another. And then we had ligand-gated. Remember, we said ligand-gated responded to chemicals. So a certain chemical comes along and fits into the lock. Right? And when it fits in a lock, the door opens and allows 
whatever channel this was for. If this was for sodium, it would allow sodium to um, diffuse in, right? It's just going from high to low, right? If it was potassium, it would allow potassium to um, diffuse out and go from high to low. Right, voltage gated, once again, right, the door is closed and doesn't allow any movement of ions until a certain voltage is met. When a first certain voltage is met, then the door opens, right, and allows things once again to diffuse. And then the last one, mechanically gated, right, it's some sort of pressure or vibration that's going to open the door and once again allow these ions to diffuse. So of right, the five types of channels, sodium potassium pumps, leakage, ligand gated, voltage gated, mechanically gated, all of those work by simple diffusion going from high to low, except for active transport, right, which was sodium potassium pumps. Sodium potassium pumps are active transport. So they require energy and they go from right a um, low to a high concentration. So because of all of these within the cell membrane of the neuron, so once again, this is that phospholipid bilayer. This is a neuron. We have all these different types of channels within there on a neuron, allows ions to move in and out. The two ions that we're going to look at um, within our next lecture that drive all this are sodium and potassium. Once again, they're ions because they have charges on them. And they're cations because they're both plus charges. So we have different, you can see concentrations within here. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. So you can see we have a lot more potassium inside the cell and a lot more sodium outside the cell. And it's because of that, um, we get this thing called a resting potential, which means that's the voltage of a neuron when it's not doing anything, when it's at rest. There's no signal going on. There's an actual voltage difference. And that's because of this <clears throat> difference in amount of ions inside and outside the neuron. All right. Um, that is where we're going to stop for today's lecture. So welcome back. So that was kind of an overview. We talked a, right, some overview physiology, right, of the anatomy. We looked at neuroglia cells, right, the six different types, and they each had their own unique job, their each own physiology within there. And then we dove in a little bit deeper to a neuron, right, that was the cell within the nervous tissue that's creating these electrical signals. And we talked a little bit about its parts, right, axons, soma, and dendrites. So hopefully you've studied all that before in your anatomy class within there. Um, and then we looked a little bit deeper into its cell membrane and looked at the different types of channels that are allowing sodium and potassium to move in and out, which is going to cause that current, right? Anytime we start moving ions, right, that changes in pluses and minuses creates voltage, which is that electrical signal. So we'll dive in our next lecture and actually look at how that happens. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then. Take care and have a great day.